All right. Well, welcome back to Useful Hour. It has been a fair t amount of time since the last uh, the last session, but I had a lot of teaching to do, and then I was out of the country for three weeks. So I'm very very glad to be back. But in today's Useful Hour, I wanted to talk about something that I complain about frequently. I figured it's not completely fair if I'm hollering at grad students for doing this in their master's and PhD presentations, if I don't at some point to talk about how to improve on the visualizations they've chosen. And the visualization that I'm conventioning about today is the dynamite plot. I have uh, an example here on the board. I, I want to explain the, uh, the origin of the term. Here we have four different groups, A, B, C, and D. There were some replicate measurements in each. And we have a bar representing the average height for group A and the average height for group B, and C and D. Then we have a whisker sticking up. So we have a, a whisker showing the upward bound of something. Frequently, this is, uh, this is a, an effort to estimate the population mean based on a sample. So you may see a upper whisker representing a, 95%, a 95 percent confidence interval. Sometimes people are showing the distribution of their data by using a standard deviation. So this upward whisker represents a standard deviation up. Sometimes they're using a standard error. Uh, but generally speaking, these, these plots are presented in such a way that it's not really clear which of those three estimates they may be using. The other problem, of course, is that if you show a whisker pointing up for some, dis some depiction of the variance of that sample, you are sort of implying that the same distance down uh, is, is used to describe the downward variance of the mean, uh, from, from this mean. So people may be assuming that just because you have a, a whisker pointing up, it has an equal projection downward to give us some estimate of the, the, the distance down. But in general, people don't specify whether they're showing a mean or a median or a mode, and people don't specify whether they're showing a a standard error, or a standard deviation, or an inner quartile, for that matter, uh, or a confidence interval. So uh, these, these, these uh, dynamite plots tend to get on people's nerves. The next question that you might ask is, why do we call them a dynamite plot? Uh, and the answer for this stems from Roadrunner cartoons. Uh, in the old days, you would see Roadrunner uh, zipping away, and Coyote was trying to capture him, but Coyote was never fast enough. So Coyote would very frequently uh, make use of dynamite in order to uh, execute some plan to capture the, 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 the roadrunner. And uh, inevitably, the, the box to make the dynamite explode looks like a box with a handle sticking out of it with a big T handle on it. And to make the dynamite explode, you push down on that plunger and then, boom, up goes the dynamite. So people call these dynamite plots because they have the, the handle and the, uh, sorry, the plunger and, and the, the box into which it fits. That's, it's not a very decorous name, but it's what it's called. Now, I, was, uh, I learned a lot of my biostatistics from the Department of Biostatistics in Vanderbilt University Medical School uh, and Medical Center. Uh, and Frank Harrell is the chair of, uh, of this department. Frank Harrell has a huge reputation in the world of R, having written some, some really useful packages that everybody uses for various tasks, such as uh, computing optimism. Frank has very strong feelings about the dynamite plot, and that's one of the reasons why I take it as sort of holy writ that if you see it in a, pr a presentation, someone is trying to hide something from you. So that's a bit of paranoia, but it's how I feel. So when I see students presenting data like this, I always think to myself, isn't there a better way? Now, I have uh, I've printed a poster, a very small poster here, that was produced by uh, Tatsuki Koyama uh, in the D Division of Cancer Biostatistics at Vanderbilt uh, University. Why are dynamite plots so bad? That's a heading on this thing. So little information. This plot includes four means and four standard deviations, or perhaps standard errors. It's a very inefficient use of space. So you've used a, a fair bit of space, maybe you've used an entire slide for your dynamite plot, but the amount of information you're giving is only twofold the number of bars you've got. Four means, four standard deviations, not very informative. Uh, what do the means mean? Averages do not, in fact, convey a lot of information. If you happen to know that you have a normally distributed data set, then the mean is one of the points that you need to be able to understand what it looks like, but the other is still the standard deviation. When people give something like a standard error, it's not really that possible visually to extrapolate back to what normal distribution these uh, are ostensibly drawn from. 
Whiskers get in the way. Whiskers might add some information, but I don't know how to use them. They kind of make the bars look a little taller, and the little information given by the bars becomes distorted by them. So if you are presenting a, a, a metric like, say, standard error above this, it's not really clear why that would, how, how you would, why you would add that to the top. It's kind of like you're adding uh, an apple, the, the mean, to an orange, the standard error, and the, the two stacked together doesn't make a lot of sense. And finally, where are the data? And this is probably the most critical issue that I have that causes me to have grief with, with dynamite plots. The, the data points upon which that plot is, is produced do not, in fact, get represented in the plot itself. So, uh, with that said, uh, I have a couple of URLs that will be available with the description of this video when it shows up on YouTube. Uh, but, in the meanwhile, I wanted to work through uh, some R code and talk about three different ways that we could visualize these data instead to give us more information. And I hope I can do it in a way that helps us all learn a little bit of R, although I suspect some of the people in the audience are actually better at R than me. So, uh, let me set that aside. Uh, I have my R window open. You can see that I've been uh, very, uh, I've installed all the extras here. Now, in fact, I've just installed the base R. Uh, you don't have to know a whole lot. Uh, of, you don't have to have like R Studio or a, a nice GUI on top of it to run this example. So, I have, uh, I have created a script that allows us to make use of two packages that are very, very uh, widely used in plotting for R. These are uh, gplots and ggplot2. ggplot2 is a ridiculously famous package for the grammar of graphics, which gives us a way to uh, define the elements of a graph uh, constructively. So uh, you need to have those two installed to run these examples. And if you're going to use those libraries, it's not enough to have them installed. You must, in fact, load those libraries. So you can see that I'm running the library command on ggplot2 and the library command on gplots in order to get both of those in place. Uh, it has some, some uh, warning messages that pop up here, but those are ordinary and they don't actually matter too much. So uh, we're going to use data from a package called toothgrowth. It's a, a very standard package, and all, all you need to do to call it and to, to invoke it is to say data tooth growth. Not bad. Now, having, uh, having loaded a data set into memory, I'm always a little curious just what I got. So let's start with my favorite command in R, summary. We're now going to run a summary on tooth growth. So what did we get from this built-in data object? We see that we have a uh, a, a field called length for length, so the, the amount of growth. Uh, we've got a minimum, a first quartile, a median, a mean, third quartile, maximum values. These are standard ways to describe this distribution of data uh, represented by the length vector. We have two different kinds of, uh, of, of sub values. We have a total of 60 uh, points in this document, and they either fall in the OJ category or the BC category. We're really going to ignore this factor for now, uh, so we don't need to think too much about that. However, we also have this field called dose. As you see, there's a minimum value of 0.5, a median value of 1, and a third quartile and maximum value of 2. So we're going to transform these data from being a, uh, a set of real numbers to transform this into a factor, and I'm going to show you why we can do that. So if I examine that particular if I look at that particular field, I can call out that particular subfield of the data frame by just using dollar sign dose. So I just want to report all of the values in this vector, tooth growth dose. Okay, and I see that there are 0.5s, and there are 1s, and there are 2s. Does anyone see any other value there? Are there any not applicables or missing values? No. So we just have those three values. So na uh, natively, the tooth growth data set is designed for us to be able to use this as a factor. But at the moment, it's not given to us as a factor, it's given, a, given us as a list of, of real numbers. So we need to transform our data just a little bit, uh, and I'm going to do that by this command. So tooth growth dose has now been replaced by tooth growth dose 
coerced into being a factor. So how did that change the nature of the data? All right, if I just report that same value, you now see that it's not reporting these as, uh, as numerics anymore. Now it's a, a factor. So if I, uh, it, you can tell that by the fact that it has a levels statement at the end. So our levels are reported as 0.5, 1, and 2. And if I repeat the summary that I did when I first loaded this, this object into RAM, I see that I have exactly 20 values for 0.5, exactly 20 values for 1, and exactly 20 values for 2. So this, this series of real numbers has been coerced into being a factor. Any, any questions before I move ahead? OK, so I'm just trying to get the data in some way that I can partition on the basis of dose. Right. So uh, let us now uh, create a function that we can use to compute standard errors because I wanted to be able to recreate uh, those, um, those dynamite plots. So we see here that I've defined a new function. This is a, it's actually not that hard to do in R. This, is, this single line then is going to create a function that returns the standard error when we pass in the standard deviation uh, sorry, when we pass in a, a vector of, of values. So, in effect, <coughs> this line defines a function called, uh, called standard error that expects to receive a vector of values. This vector of values will be used to compute a standard deviation, and it will be used to compute the square root of the length of x, the length of x. So, if I pass it 20 values, it's going to compute the standard deviation based on those 20 values. It's going to count how many items are in the list because there are 20. It will take the square root of, of 20. Then it divides the, the standard deviation by square root of that, of that n. So pretty easy function. And having it in a concrete function like this lets us use it in this next, uh, this next set of features. So we are going to compute our means, standard deviations, and standard errors for producing a dot plot. Or our, our dynamic plot. So I'm using the aggregate function. So we're going to aggregate our tooth growth lengths based on the, uh, the, the, these three factor levels, these three doses that are available. So we're going to create an object called a means aggregate, another one called a standard deviation aggregate, and another one called the standard error aggregate. Now it may not be completely obvious, so I'm going to scroll a little over to the right uh, so that we can all see the example. You see that at the right, I'm supplying the function that we are going to aggregate across this, this list. So in the first case, we're using the mean function. In the second function, we're using standard deviation. And in the third, we're using standard error, the function we just defined. So what results from that object? If I type means ag, you can see that the software has now split up this vector into three parts, 0.5, 1, and 2. And for each one, it has computed the mean separately. So at no point did I have to, well, the, the old, I, as I said, I'm kind of an old and poor R programmer. One of the things I would have done in the old days is to create subsets out of this data set. So I might make a, uh, a 2.5 set that subsets out only those values for which dose equals 0.5. And then I might create another subset for those where I'd used a value of 1 and another subset for the values of, one, of 2. I didn't have to do that in this case because they were already separated on the basis of this factor that we, that we defined off of 0.5, 1, and 2. And by using aggregate, I'm able to automatically split those up and apply a function across all that were in each of those subsets. OK, so if I look at the means, I see that my means rise from about 10.6 to about 19.7 to about 26.1. We can also look at the standard deviations that resulted from that and the standard errors. So you can see that those have all been computed. Now, which is larger for a normal distribution, the standard deviation or the standard error? There's one case in which those numbers are identical. If you have a distribution that contains a single value. But as soon as you have more than one value, standard error is always smaller. Now we're going to talk about the visual impact of that on the dynamite plots in just a moment. So for now, 
let us make our dynamite plot using the rplot2 function. All right, rplot2, here we go. Okay, so this is our first edition of the bar plot. Um, we start with, uh, oh, pull over here. So we're passing it the means aggregate. This is the set of mean values that it's going to use for the bars. We're specifying that the bars should be beside each other rather than being a stacked bar plot. And we're providing it a legend that gives it all the different levels of dose. Uh, you can see that I've required it to give a confidence interval we're forcing that to be in place. And we have a, a, a lower and a higher value on these. So the bar plot 2 function has whiskers built into it. If you're doing this in Excel, obviously it's going to look quite different. You're going to be editing uh, graph elements and so on. We can do that if that's useful to you guys. But in this case, we're just telling bar plot 2 we do want to plot confidence intervals. The lower value for that confidence interval is what? It's the mean itself. So effectively what we're saying is when you make a lower whisker for this bar plot, put the whisker at exactly the top of the bar at the mean itself. So this is effectively the same thing as saying don't print a lower, a lower whisker because the whisker is just over plotting the top of the bar. Then this confidence interval upper is the mean aggregate plus the standard deviation aggregate. Everyone sees that? Okay. So we are, we're trying to do the plot now that shows the uh, only one whisker going up, revealing the standard deviations. And what do we get in response to that? This is what we get. So I have to say it's not beautifully formatted for the eye here, but we'll, we'll just kind of go with it for the moment. We have three bars, the legend colors there in red and orange and yellow. I realize that uh, with the lights on, it's a little harder to see there, uh, are each reflecting these three different doses we have our, remember, about 10, about 20, and about 26, I think, were the means. So the, height, the heights of these three bars follow those means, and the upper, upper whisker on these is showing us the standard deviation up. So what's, if, if you're thinking about this as a visualization you're going to show on a poster, uh, and you're a crafty graduate student, graduate, graduate student, one of the first things you're probably going to think is, those error bars look big. And I would really rather show these bars a little tighter. I'd like, I'd like them to not showcase that I had a lot of variability in my data. OK, so how do we cheat? Well, we just said that standard error is almost always smaller than standard deviation. If you give it more than one point, it's smaller. So one of the things that we can do is simply change the way that we call this bar plot so that we are showing standard errors instead. So we plop over to our console and put in this command. So how do we make it look better using standard errors? Well, it's actually not that difficult. Here we've just changed our plotting of the confidence intervals. Oh, I needed to pull one, one further to the right there. All right, so we were just saying a moment ago that standard deviations made our, our whiskers stand out a little bit too much. And being crafty graduate students, we want to reduce the impact of variability <coughs> on our figure. So we are, we're now trying the same command. Remember we said that we were setting our lower whisker as, e as being equal to the mean. So we have just the one whisker, just the upper whisker. Here we simply change its, uh, from, from adding the standard deviation aggregate to the standard error aggregate. So how much did that change the look of our plot? If I click over to the graphics, suddenly we see that our variability looks very, very small indeed. Because remember, we had something like 20 values for each of these. Those 20 values are, means that we're dividing by the square root of 20 all that standard deviation that we'd seen before. So this is a, this is a very frequent option. When you ask graduate students, why did you use standard error for your plot, the frequent answer is, it looks better. Okay? We need a better reason than that for, uh, for showing why our visualizations do what they do. So let's consider uh, an important possibility. If you're showing the standard deviation and the mean of a, of a distribution, you are implying that the data you are looking at are normally distributed. 
That is not necessarily the case. The data may be exponentially distributed. You may have substantial outliers in play. This visualization that gives only a mean and some estimate of the spread is very insufficient for showing what that distribution looks like. And that is one of the reasons why Mr. Tukey provided us the, the magic of box plots. Now I'm going to pass around this, uh, this, this uh, image. You can just leave the camera where it is. There you are. So let us, let us consider the way in which we might produce a plot that shows the distribution of our data, not just these two points, not just something about its central tendency and the spread of the data. OK, so we are now going to use a, uh, a, we're going to use what's called the base package for doing a simple plot of these data the way that R would do it more or less by default. OK, I'm going into my console. And I'm going to paste in our line. Now, you can see this is a really simple command. I'm just using the, the base plot option on this data frame, telling it that I want to separate on a factor on my x-axis. And on the y-axis, I'm going to give these, these length values. So what is the image that results from it? What we have is a box plot. And box plots are hugely valuable whenever you're plotting anything. Uh, any sort of distribution. You can see that this is going to fit in exactly the same space as the dynamite plot does, but suddenly we have a lot more information presented. Typically, what one sees in a box plot is an attempt to assess what the distribution looks like in a non-parametric way. Come on, it's fine. So we have, in this case, a median value, so the, the value that falls in the middle of, of the ordered uh, data points. We have an, a 75th percentile and a 25th percentile. So this is spelling out the interquartile range. Where, where do the middle 50% of the data fall? And then we have lower and upper whiskers. The way that those get defined can be a little curious. So um, the general rule that we see for, uh, showing these, uh, for showing whiskers in a box plot is built around the size of the interquartile below it. So this value pointing upward is generally speaking allowed to be up to one and a half times the size of this, of this upper middle quartile. And this lower whisker is allowed to be as much as 1.5 times the width of this lower, uh, of this, this, um, lower middle quartile. So in this case, we see that uh, there's not a whole lot of room downward on this, uh, but there is a fair amount upwards. So if you, if you saw a, a situation where the upper middle quartile was very tall and the whisker atop that was even taller, uh, you might be concerned that what you're looking at are not, in fact, normally distributed. So that can be uh, quite the impact on what this visualization looks like. So a box plot is a very standard way to do it. Now, I mentioned I was just using the base graphics package of R to do this. It's just the plot command called on a data frame. Uh, where we had a factor in this value and, a, and a, a vectors of real numbers on the, on the length category. So creating these plots is very straightforward. But a lot of people would really prefer something that looks a little, a little prettier than, than a simple box plot. So uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples now working from not the base graphics package, but the ggplot route. So we're going to start with a very simple plot uh, just the, the base bo box plot as produced by ggplot2. Now remember, I've already loaded the ggplot2 library into, into memory. So in this case, I am going to create an object that is a ggplot. It's going to be built around this data frame, uh, and we're going to be using the dose and length category, uh, the dose and length fields for our visualization. So remember, there was that second field in there about whether uh, I think it was VC or OJ. I forget what they were, what that factor represented. But we're simply ignoring that for the purposes of this plot right now. So I've given it dose, which we remember is either 0 0.5, 1, or 2, one of those three values. So these three levels in a factor and these real values. And now we're going to plot them. But we have to specify how we do it. And this is really one of the powerful bits about the Grammar of Graphics library, the ggplot2 library. Having created this object that represents a plot, we can now add on a layer to it that represents the box plot type. So we instantiate the object 
but it doesn't visualize anything until we actually add the box plot type on top of it. So when we look at what results, we see that this has come out. Now, this looks quite similar to what we were looking at just a moment ago, but it's got some important differences. And ggplot2, for example, tends to layer in this gray background behind everything, has some, uh, a grid pa pattern for us. We see that it's uh, labeled what the three values of dose were for us, and it's also labeled the length field uh, on the, the y-axis. Instead of producing uh, whiskers that end in a little T, it just creates these whisker bars without handles on them. And the other thing that I would note is that this point up here is shown as an outlier. So this is a key thing that shows up very frequently when we're looking at box plots, and each one implements it in a very slightly different way. But remember that I said that these, uh, these upper whiskers are allowed to be as much as one and a half times the size of the, the uh, quartile nearest them. Well, that's fine, but sometimes the data fall outside that. And in this case, ggplot2 decided this data point falls so far outside that realm that it must be called an outlier and not part of the main distribution itself. So we see that the, our box plot can be produced by the base graphics, and here it can be produced by the grammar of graphics library, the ggplot2 library. Okay, but now that we've adapted ourselves to working in ggplot2, there's some really nice things that we can do to add to this. So one of the first that I'm going to do is to start with a, kind of a simple statistical test that we can add on top of this image. So we're going to use that same uh, instantiation. We're still going to create a ggplot uh, image like this, and we're still going to create the box plot uh, style on top of it. But now we're adding this notch feature. Notched box plots uh, allow us some, some way of differentiating uh, different boxes across the plot. So if you have data that are very tightly distributed, the notch will be quite small. If you have data that are very loosely distributed, the notch will be taller. So you can see that our 0.5 notch stretches from maybe 12 down to about 8, but the notch for the next plot over runs up to about 22 and down to about, say, 16. The fact that these notches do not overlap is, is one way that we could just glance at the thing and say, these bars don't overlap. You'll see some people say that if the bars overlap at all, you, you know that they're not significantly different. That's not technically speaking true. If the, if the bars overlap, you may still have uh, data that are significantly different. And adding these notches can give you a bit, of, uh, a bit of a lever on figuring out whether or not they're actually significantly different. So the notch box plot is a, a very small revision away from where we started with the box plot but it already has more information in it. Okay, now we're going to go to a third edition and you're really going to start seeing the layering that is characteristic of ggplot2. All right. So once again, we're instantiating a ggplot, we're starting with the box plot. This time, we're, we're getting rid of the notch. I'm just going to toss that out for the moment. But we are adding a jitter plot, and jitter plots are actually one of the most preferred ways of visualizing uh, uh, piles of data if you've got 20 or fewer data points. If you have 1,000 data points, Jitter is not going to help you much. But we'll show you what this looks like in just a moment. So let's, uh, let's click over to the, the graphic that results from this. All right. So we still have our underlying bars. The, the, the box plots are still here. Uh, you remember it said that there was a, a data point that was an outlier up here? Well, that, that data point is now actually visualized here. The jittering is causing the, the points in each distribution to be sprayed a little bit left and right, which allows it to pack a whole lot more uh, data points in here. So even if you have 20 points, you can see their real distribution visually. So in, in any case you've got 20 replicates or fewer, uh, simply showing all the points is actually the best way to, uh, to give you statistical inference ability from just looking at the at the, uh, the visualization. So these jitter plots are very nice. It's a little noisy though to superimpose the one on the other. So what if we just get rid of the boxes altogether and just do our jitter plot? Okay. 
So in all of these previous examples with ggplot2, we were, we were giving it a box plot as, as the first layer that we added on top of this uh, instantiated ggplot. This time, though, we're just adding geom jitter. So if we get rid of the boxes and simply do the points themselves, then we get a distribution like this. So this is not a bad visualization of the data. It means every experiment resulted in a point on this graph, and you can see at a, at a glance where all of those are. Now, I do find it rather difficult when looking at something like this to say, where's the mean? I mean, I'm going to say it's somewhere in here, but frankly, I find it easier to spot a median on this plot than I would a mean. Do you see why? Because if you know that there are 20, you can just count the points down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So right here about 10 is our median. But I, visually, it's a lot harder to just say, ah, oh, the mean must be about 10.1 from looking at these data points. So some statistical interpretation, like a box plot with the, the dots superimposed on it, is actually a little better than simply showing just the data themselves. And as I mentioned, if you have 100 data points, uh, this, this kind of plotting becomes very busy and very hard to interpret quite quickly. All right. Now, these, uh, these jitter plots are not the only option that we've got. Um, I'm going to start by asking about density plots. Has anyone done a density plot before? Density plots are one of my favorites. Have you heard of histograms? OK. So let's, uh, let's examine what we get from a histogram here. For this, I'm going to pull open two windows side by side. All right, tile those vertically. We'll try to do it this way. OK, so you can see it just rescaled everything for us. That's, that's kind of handy. <coughs> so uh, I want to plot, uh, let me see, here we go. Plot the density, well, uh, tooth growth. I'm doing it wrong here. It's just hist. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> what am I doing? Tooth growth. Oh, it's lowercase len. Ah. ah. Okay, those are the points. Let's do a histogram. There we are. Okay. If you've ever done a histogram in Excel you probably spent a lot more time than I did just trying to remember what the commands were. Doing a, a histogram properly is difficult, and then figuring out where the boundaries should be for each bin uh, can, can take a little adjustment too. So you see that if you've got a vector of numbers in R, and you want to produce a histogram from it, it's a one-liner. Histogram of that value, the software will automatically figure out how many bars it can put, and there you go, now we've got our, our histogram. But sometimes these histograms are a little chunky, and you'd like to know about the density of these data across a, a number line. So for that, we can use a density function. So plot density, not density, density tooth growth length. Okay. So now, R has used a kernel. A, a kernel has effectively rolled across that number line and asked, what, what the, what's the density of data points in the neighborhood of this kernel? So plot density of tooth growth shows us the visualization of that, that impact as we moved across. And you can ask things like, where are they most closely uh, uh, scattered? Well, this right here at this point is where they are. So uh, Now, I haven't done the separation out into different um, bars here, so like different levels of dose. Remember, we had dose of 0.5 and 1 and 2. So the violin plot is a way to show density as a, as a function of some factor. So uh, I've, I've got an example here where we can do that. So we're going to, again, just use a, uh, a function call that's built into ggplot2. All right. Oops. I'm going to pull this back open full screen. OK. So again, we create a ggplot image built around tooth growth, same call to dose and length. Those are the only factors included. This time, we're using a call to geom violin as, as the type of visualization that we want to use. 
if we click over to the graphics device, we see that we now have this representation of these. So effectively what you're looking at is a, a, a density plot like we were looking at just a moment ago, split out by each of the, the three different dose factor levels that we had, and made uh, symmetric just by duplicating on two sides. So this is really very valuable because now suddenly we get the impression that the length values reported for the 0.5 dose were bimodal. Bimodal. Has everyone, has everyone heard that term before? Okay, a, a bimodal distribution is not something like a normal distribution. A normal distribution is unimodal, meaning it has one most common value. So when we have a bimodal distribution, it means we have two, uh, two values around which the numbers cluster. So we have some set of numbers that are around, say, 16, and another set that are around 10. So there's a split in this distribution that wasn't completely apparent from just looking at the dot plot or looking, from the looking at the box. So the violin plot has already given us some sort of distributional information that we didn't have before. Now, uh, I would also note that the top of this has been truncated and the bottom of this has been truncated, and so, so, so have these others. Basically, the, the plot is saying, I no longer have enough points at this distance to get a good estimate of what the, the profile of points looks like. So we may want to have those data points back. And that brings us to the last visualization I prepped, which is an untrimmed violin plot. So trimming is inherent in the, uh, is inherent in the ge ge geometric violin plot. So if you turn off trimming, suddenly you get a somewhat different look to your data. So those data now extend out further. Uh, so the software is, is doing its best to show you uh, any place where that kernel density is greater than zero at all. So just because uh, the, the highest data point that we had for this category, I believe, was around 20, wasn't it? So that's its, the last place where it can really estimate the, the density. And then we see from there it's just tapering off. But trimming or not trimming on the violin plot will change the, the look of the thing. Okay, so that's four different ways then to plot these distributions of data. We talked about the dynamite plot, but that little uh, that little uh, screed that I had on the poster there. Oh, would you like to go and pass it over to her to, to look as well? Uh, it's clear that a lot of statisticians have very strong feelings about dynamite plots, and most people most people discuss their dynamite plots in such a lack of detail that we aren't really sure what we're looking at. Box plots are almost always preferable. And if you can show all of the data points that, uh, that contribute to them, that's even better. So we talked about doing that in ggplot2. You can do box plots with any library you like. I mean, as I said, it's, it's built into R. But the, uh, this formatting of being able to do it in ggplot2 means that you can add things like the, the, the jittered points overlaid on the, the box distribution that we've, that we've inferred as well. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, in general, the rule would be if you have, say, 20 points or less, it's really very valuable to just show them all. So using something like a jitter plot to superimpose the real data on your, on your diagram makes it a much more informative exercise and makes your uh, makes your science more open than simply presenting the means as though that's the only important value. If you have upwards of 20 points, jitter plots start getting kind of messy. Uh, and for that, something like a violin plot is a really good substitute. As we see, once you have uh, very, very few data points, the violin plots start getting very non-descriptive very quickly. So think of this when you have something like 100 uh, different uh, data points that you need to summarize. Okay. Well, thank you for coming to this uh, restored uh, period of the useful hour, and hopefully we'll be back next week. Thank you.